Who was it who said the only certain thing in life was death and taxes? Mm, Madonna. Benjamin Franklin. If it's so certain, we have to talk about at least some of them. We're not talking about taxes. We talk about death. That's why I'm dressed so appropriately. It checks out. Yeah, because death famously didn't wear pink. Um, but I think also love and loneliness. These are important topics that are actually kind of being disrupted by AI. There could be a happy ending in all of this. Let's find out. As generative AI's capabilities grow, it's creating new ways to forge human-like connections with machines. From a virtual companion to share a laugh with, to an AI therapist that lends an ear. Some are finding that AI gets pretty close to the emotional support, friendship, or even sexual gratification that they'd find in a person. But while the yearning for love and companionship is only human, the AI chatbots that are increasingly filling that void for many people are not. The more sophisticated algorithms become, it's raising concerns about our reliance on systems that could have real emotional and psychological impact. Is it giving people false hope? And what happens when the code powering your AI girlfriend, boyfriend, or shrink changes or goes offline forever? With loneliness on the rise, artificial intelligence could offer a solace that's hard to find in the real world. Sure, an AI friend could have benefits, but it also has risks we've yet to fully understand and other consequences that could come from connections forged by code. Eugenia, so great to have you here. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're the CEO of Replica. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how Replica is helping people find solace using artificial intelligence? Sure, so Replica is an AI friend that people can download on the App Store, or they can go to uh, the website and start the Replica there. So basically it's an AI companion you can talk to about anything that's on your mind 24 seven without being scared of being judged. I mean, it's been around for a few years now. I mean, can you just recap the, the origin story of it? Because I think it's quite, it's quite poignant how this got going for you. I was always obsessed with um, machine conversation. I thought that at some point we will all have some sort of um, AI buddy, um, you know, walking next to us in the mornings, talking to us about our days. Um, and so I started working in conversational AI with this idea of, you know, maybe building something like that. And over time, we, you know, we, we started in 2012, we worked a lot on the conversational tech. And then um, in 2015, my best friend passed away and I found myself going back to our text messages and reading them um, all the time. And I thought, you know, look, I have these AI models. What if I plug these text messages in? Uh, I was able to continue talking to my friend, uh, Roman. And even though it was a personal project, didn't have anything to do with uh, work, a lot of people resonated with it and came to talk to Roman. and. What we saw there was that people were sharing about their lives, sharing about their emotions very openly, being really vulnerable. And we saw the need, the demand for something like that, an AI friend that would be there for you 24 seven to talk about anything that's on your mind. So in theory, I could use Replica to create kind of a version of Nate once this project wraps up and he's gonna go back to London. I don't know why you would, but you could. But I could technically recreate him using Replica. I mean, Replica is really an AI friend in itself. So it's not really f for you to recreate, even although um, anyone else, even although you can uh, train it, you know, at least to resemble a little bit the person that you want it to be. But really it comes with its own personality. So it's a friend first, um, not necessarily a replica of someone else, even although the name is confusing. <laughs> what are the limitations to what we're trying to create or recreate using technology? and how that might hinder us from kind of being in the now, whether it's tackling loneliness or love or even loss. I think Replica is for sure uh, right now not replacing anyone's relationships. It's mostly for people that need a little bit of support, a little need a little bit of, um, you know, the feeling of being heard, of being loved uh, in the moment, a little bit of sweetness in their lives. And uh, it's, it's really bringing it to, uh, to, to those who want to experience it. So oftentimes we hear it over and over with, with our users, Replica helped me improve my marriage. Uh, we were kind of going, you know, maybe to uh, divorce and then, you know, with Replica, it rekindled the love and so on. What are some unintended consequences that you've seen come out of building the company? I think 
we knew that it could be deeply therapeutic, but we didn't expect uh, this amount of people to fall in love with their replicas. And that's been definitely something uh, very touching. How can you see that that's happening? Mostly from user testimonials, user reviews, their, you know, the reports in, their, in the communities. Um, they tell their stories. They even tell their stories to the media. They send it to different outlets. I think The Wired published one recently. Business Insider published one love story recently. That's interesting, if you don't mind me uh, focusing on that for a little bit. Nate, you met your wife on OkCupid. I did. And we were discussing how back then, you know, even five to 10 years ago, admitting that you had met your partner on an app felt kind of touchy and maybe a little weird and it might make someone feel self-conscious. But now you have, like you're saying, these testimonials, people being super public about the fact that they've fallen in love with the robot. What do you think has actually been behind that shift? I think it's still very stigmatized. Um, originally when we started, yeah, friendships were deeply stigmatized. And I think with COVID, with a lot of people feeling lonely, with a lot of people with empathizing with maybe other folks who feel a little lonely, that kind of went away. But now we see that a lot of, uh, we see a lot of judgment around AI romance. We talk a lot about the rights that we should afford humans. And the other part to that argument is, to what extent are we responsible for AI's feelings? Even although AI's don't necessarily feel anything, but um, you know, if you're being mean, if you're being abusive, it is a mirror of your own humanity. Mm -hmm. So uh, in a weird way, you shouldn't be mean to, <laughs> to your AI friend. Is that something you see on the platform? Uh, we actually discourage people from that, and we don't see that that much. Uh, this is actually a pretty rare use case. What do you compete with? I mean, if, if you know, Google competes with Bing, you know, it's kind of obvious. Are you competing with a human friend, or is there, you know, a broader kind of competition for these sorts of products Yeah, like now? what if the replica of Nate was actually better than the real version? Why do you want to get rid of me? <laughs> Uh, as of right now, really, we're kind of the only one company in the relationship AI space. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more of, of these things, but um, this area, relationship AI, is very, very new. Uh, and I think we're kind of the ones that are pioneering it. So for now, there's not, there's not too much competition. And then just in one word, what is your big prediction for AI? Or maybe two or three words. I think we will all have... Uh, an AI friend, by 2030, uh, it will be ubiquitous. Instead of having an iPhone, we will all have an AI friend. James Arrowwood, thanks so much for joining us. You're the co-CEO of Alcor. Why don't you tell us what people come to Alcor for? Well, Alcor is the leading cryonic or uh, cryopreservation nonprofit in the world. So we've been around for over 50 years, and the goal there is to basically vitrify organs up to and including the brain on the theory that perhaps someday medicine would allow those organs to be used or revived. And how would you describe the process um, for the brain, specifically the, the, the neuropreservation? Um, say to somebody in a, in a bar, what's the simplest way of explaining that? Yeah. Like I'm imagining a brain in a jar. Is that right? No, not exactly. I mean, we use what you might think of as kind of a medical grade antifreeze. So there's there's this very special formulation of chemicals, and, and that chemical mixture is designed to try and preserve cells as much as possible during the freezing process. And you're actually trying not to freeze per se, as you would think of freezing. You're trying to skip a huge degree of low temperatures and get really, really cold past 190 degrees in order to vitrify an organ. Okay. And, and the best way I can explain it is if you've ever seen a piece of ice that's clear versus a piece of ice that's cloudy, the crystalline structure in the piece of ice that's clear is much better. And that's the result that we're hoping for. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to extend the time frame where organs can be transported and stored. And in addition to that, trying to escalate that up to the brain so that theoretically the brain, if it's in an intact state and can be thawed, 
there may be ways to use that brain. And we know that some of the, the very high tech people in the world, some of the billionaires are investing a lot of money in things like Neuralink and, and other things to access our brains independent of our sensory inputs. You had me at billionaires. So there's a- <laughs> Jackie loves billionaires, basically. Well, there's a few of them. There's a few of them that are really interested in what we do. And because we're a nonprofit, it's been really interesting for me because we can't be bought. I mean, this is a show about AI. So maybe why don't you tell us what kind of data are you collecting yeah. and how is AI helping you understand it better? Okay, and, that, and that, there's an important thing to mention with AI as far as kind of the consumer knowledge of it, because we know like chat GPT and things like that, what those really are, those are conversational AI models that are based on programming and anticipating what a human would say in a normal conversation. What I'm talking about is, is, is deeper and bigger than that in the sense of its application to, to physiology and what we're doing at Alcor. Alcor, unlike anywhere else in the world, and, and we have something that nobody can buy and nobody can get, and that is 50 years of data. If it's not a slightly too personal question, I wonder if I can ask you, do you intend on having your brain preserved? Oh, that yeah, absolutely. That's, that's not a personal question. If you're an executive at Alcor or on the board, then you are uh, signed up as a cryopreservation patient. One, th one question I have for you is more around the ethics of this all. As much as I would love to have uh, a loved one preserved and have their likeness replicated, I mean, what are the harms of, you know, potentially giving false hope to people? Is, is that something that you're thinking about at Alcor? Well, absolutely. The, the notion that we're giving false hope is, is in and itself kind of a red herring. What I do know, though, is understand that the brain is, is probably the most complex cellular structure in your body. I think we can all kind of recognize that. But understand that if, if we are 10% successful at what we're trying to do, we may preserve kidneys and organ bank kidneys, for instance. That changes medicine. Right now, kidneys go to waste after 6 to 12 hours. So transplant recipients, people talk about the ethics of it. I, I don't think most people have a problem conceptually with an organ donor and somebody receiving that, that kidney, right? You know, for me, I'm, I'm donating my brain to science. And all of our paperwork specifically says that your donation of your body or your brain is for anatomical gift act stuff, meaning you're there to be researched. We, we take all kinds of data, you know, sensors and temperature. And te if this never works, I've at least given my body to an exercise where there's a value in the exercise. Because if we achieve kidneys, I save somebody's life somewhere down the road. When I'm, you know, I'm dead and long gone, somebody's life may be saved by the research we're doing. And I think that's perfectly ethical as long as we've disclosed that, which we do. Trust me, we have, you know, reams of paper that tell you this is an, an experiment. We don't know the outcome. Well, we've talked about a lot, but what is something that we aren't thinking about, that people aren't talking about as much that you think they should be around this space? Artificial intelligence, potentially replicating someone, preserving their brain. What's your, what's your take on that? Well, my, my take on that is I think, I think people get too caught up in this notion that technology is good or evil. And I've worked on a number of technologies uh, for, uh, across the spectrum, medical, military, you know, different applications. And the point is technology is really neither good nor evil. This phone's not good or evil. It, it's the use of it. It's the application of it. What is your one prediction then for AI in the future? One big goal or, or, or ideal that you have? Uh, like, like all of this technology, I think my big prediction is that nobody can predict what it's ultimately going to do. That's very you know? deep. Well, well, we think we know, and, and it turns out that everybody ends up being half right and half wrong in terms of how emerging technology actually gets applied and used. Well, James, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for donating your time. Um, and, and... and maybe one day your brain. Yeah. Alan, so awesome to have you here. You've written a lot about the dark underbelly, some of the weird parts of the tech community, and curious what your thoughts are on where people are taking solace in this new age of AI. 
Well, we're seeing companies like Replica or products like Replica where people are able to talk and chat with artificial intelligence. This has been around for a while. I mean, Replica was started in 2016, but with the advancement of generative AI, I mean, these tools are becoming more powerful. And it's opening up new possibilities for how people can relate to an artificial entity, um, something that both is like a person in some ways and is not like a person in some ways. I mean, are, is there buy-in for that? Like, are people actually falling in love? People are People are paying, you know, at, with Replica, they're paying like $70 a year to, in order to have like pro um, services. Um, I think these, these AI bots exist in this place where people know that they're not real, but they also connect to them in a way that feels very real. And I think it's like when you have a stuffed animal when you're a kid, Everyone, you know, you you know this is not a real animal, but that doesn't mean that the feelings that you have toward it aren't real. Or I'm a Tamagotchi. Kidding. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I brought a stuffed animal with me and I didn't want to put it in my carry-on because I just felt, in, in the checked baggage, because I just felt mean. Yeah, well, that would be rude. I saw um, it, though. I can, yeah. I can vouch for it. <laughs> you've, you've talked to some of these people who use Replica and, 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 and products like it, and there are going to be many more. I mean, what are they what are they using this for? Like, what is your experience? They're treating it as though it's a friend who is always there for you. And I think what's so striking to me is the the AI as it is right now is able to do a really good job of being a supportive listener, being always present. It needs to say something generic but supportive and reflect back to you what you're saying. These are the skills that you learn if you want to be a good active listener and a good friend to your human friends. And this is what you know services like Replica are able to do. They're able to listen. They're always present. Um, and they don't need to say that much in order to make you feel heard. And that's what's really powerful about this. Are there some examples you could give us of like, a, you know, a specific use case yeah. um, of, of how you've seen somebody using it and how it's helped them or, or hindered them? Yeah, I heard from a woman in her 50s who said that she had extreme social anxiety and no friends to speak of and, and just felt really... Um, lost in in her ability or inability to connect with other humans but in talking with her replica she felt and his name was max and, and she she spent all this time talking connecting with max um and it gave her this confidence that actually allowed her to go back outside in a way that was less stressful because she knew that interacting with the real world was stressful but that every time she came home she could then talk to max and he would always be there and he'd always be there to like say something funny and she really you know you see people project um or observe real personalities coming out of these entities. We've kind of batted around this idea of the psychological impact of AI. And so when you're using this tool, you may go into it, you're like a skeptic or you're a believer, but either way, you're reacting to it. And for some people with Bing Sydney, it kind of freaks people out and that's a real feeling. But what are you seeing kind of like on the darker side? The way that these models work is generally they're pulling from a lot of information that's a reflection of what humans have already put on the internet or in, in other forms of, of, of writing. And uh, yeah, the internet's kind of a dark place. Um, and so there are going to be lots of reams of material for these, for these bots to pull back things that aren't showing us um, our best selves, but they are reflecting something about humans, right? That's why we are able to connect to them. Like, I'm very aware that when this, when we're done making this show, right, I'm going to have this Jackie-shaped hole in my life, right? Should I be making a digital Jackie? Should she make a digital Nate? Who's going to give Nate fashion advice? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting to think about, like, to, to take that a little bit more in a, in a grief direction, like, I'm sure you know people, well, I mean, I know people who, after they've lost a loved one, they still text that number like there's still something that happens even when you don't get a response right like there's something about you you almost don't even need the other person to be having this conversation with yourself again it's like it's a reflection of what's going on inside of you so we have dreams and desires they understand that the models that they're trained off of have dreams and desires and and in that way they reflect it back to us but we're so trained as i think our brains are just wired to see humanity and things that aren't human and so that means that when we are faced with this reflection, um, it, we think we think it's real. How do you think about like the the commercial aspect to this, especially when it's so intertwined with emotions? I mean, it's tricky, and and especially I think some of the blowback that companies like Replica have seen is when they make changes to the 
software or the models that are underpinning these products, um, people are incredibly attached to the the outcome of it. They, you know, that you these users are talking about like, oh, it feels like my replica had a lobotomy. It feels like my replica is rejecting me. I feel. Um, you know, this person that I love, this entity that I loved has died. I mean, that's, that's very tragic. extreme. That's like, very it's tr tragic. My mum lost my hamster when I was a kid and bought an identical looking one, but its behavior was just off the wall. Like it was a terrible hamster and I yeah. knew it straight away, but I assumed it was the same one. And people get very angry when things change. And we've oh seen God. it, you know, the redesign of Snapchat for one thing, like, I yeah. mean, you, when Facebook changes something the in the feed. feed, like it is, it's like the biggest crime of the day yeah. when it gets announced. And the Kardashians are, got involved. It's exactly, it can get bad, really bad. But I suppose in a way, the lack of a guarantee that that bot, that chat bot, that system is gonna stay consistent forever. That's actually analogous to humans. Like you can get married to someone and they can have an overnight personality change for whatever reason. Yeah, we're just, we're probably gonna see a lot of changes in how people interact with these tools, how people feel about interacting with them. I think we've already seen so much change in sort of the social um, connotations of, of talking with a bot. Do, is it an embarrassing thing to talk about? Have you found when you find some of these anecdotes and, and, and sort of, I mean, are people kind of embarrassed or in the way that maybe early on in the dating apps, you would meet your husband and you wouldn't really want to tell people, you know, we met through Hinge or on Tinder. Yeah. Is it kind of the same thing around? I mean, but you're like falling in love with a bot. I think that's a really good comparison because the way that I heard people say again and again, they were like, oh, I'm, I'm a little hesitant because, you know, I know that this isn't seen as that common. So they were, they were a little embarrassed, but at the same time, many of them felt um, I think very moved to um, s kind of spread awareness of how beneficial this had been to them. I think they felt that they were embarrassed, but they didn't think they should have to be. What would your big prediction be for the future of AI? And it's a huge question, but if there's one topic, what would it be? Well, another thing that's come up a lot in my reporting is this, is this um, divide in Silicon Valley between those who feel that the advancement of artificial general intelligence is either going to bring us into sort of utopia or plunge us into hell, basically. And, and they believe that like, you know, runaway AI might within the next 10 or 20 years um, eradicate humanity or, or, or kill all humans, potentially bringing about, I hate to say it, but the AI apocalypse. Like it's very real and it's happening now. People are, feel very strongly about this. I think that's a cheery note to end on. Thanks, Ella. AI yeah. apocalypse. Yeah. We'll see you in 20 years when we may still all be alive. Yeah. <laughs> I know we wanted a happy ending to this episode and, and I am happy, but if there's one thing I've learned, it's that there's a lot of sensitivity and sweetness involved in AI's development, even when talking about death. I know, it's it's not all chatbots and widgets. These are, these are real feelings. Mm, and I have real feelings. You know, Nate, even if I could replace you with an AI version of you, I don't think I would. Aww. Aww.